I'm honored to have received such a wonderful introduction and also to uh, speak with, uh, speak to such a, such a large audience tonight. Specialist for Leslie H. Sabo, distinguished himself by conspicuous acts of gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty at the cost of his own life in Company B, 3rd Battalion, 506th Infantry, 101st Airborne Division in Saison, Cambodia on May 10, 1970. On that day, Specialist 4 Sabo and his platoon were conducting a reconnaissance patrol when they were ambushed from all sides by a, by a large enemy force. Without hesitation, Specialist 4 Sabo charged an enemy position, killing several enemy soldiers. Immediately after, he assaulted an enemy flanking force, successfully drawing their fire from friendly soldiers and ultimately forcing the enemy to retreat. In order to resupply ammunition, he sprinted across an open field to a wounded comrade. As he began to reload, an enemy grenade landed nearby. Specialist Force Sabo picked it up, threw it, and shielded his comrade with his own body, thus absorbing the brunt of the blast and saving his comrade's life. Seriously wounded by the blast, Specialist Force Sabo nonetheless retained the initiative and single-handedly charged an enemy bunker that had inflicted severe damage on the platoon, receiving several wound, serious wounds from automatic weapons fire in the process. Now mortally wounded, he crawled toward the enemy emplacement and, when in position, threw a grenade into the bunker. The resulting explosion silenced the enemy's fire, but also ended Specialist Force Sabo's life. His indomitable courage and complete disregard for his own safety saved the lives of many of his platoon members. Specialist Four Sabo's extraordinary heroism and selflessness, above and beyond the call of duty at the cost of his life, are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, Company B, 3rd Battalion, 506th Infantry, 101st Airborne Division, and the United States Army. Many of you may be familiar with, the, with, those wording, with that wording as common to uh, a Medal of Honor citation. If this, if this talk were simply about Leslie Sabo's story, we could be done right now. Sabo, central figure, of, central figure in the book company, was, Sabo was central figure in the book company of heroes. And I hesitate to refer to it as my book because it really belongs to the men, he, to Sabo and the men he served with. And don't get excited, we're not getting out early tonight. First of all, I'd like to thank the Army Heritage and Education Center for having me here tonight. It's in considering some of the some of the other people who've spoken up here, and you can see the pictures. You can see the posters along the walls of some of them. Buzz Aldrin's is hidden behind that uh, behind that screen, by the way. Uh, it's it's an enormous honor for me to be here. I'd, I'd like to thank. I'd also like to thank Carl Warner for helping me for helping walk me through. He, He's been a terrific handler all day long. And uh, this is probably the second greatest privilege I've ever received. The first being, the first having been called brother by the men of Bravo Company. And that, that brings me to my final acknowledgement. I'd like to thank, I'd also like to thank the men of Bravo Company in uh, 3rd Battalion, 506th Regiment, 101st Airborne Division in 1969, who served in 1969 and 70 in Vietnam for sharing their stories with me. As a, as a member of the Dirty, Rotten, Stinking News media, I, I know that uh, sometimes Vietnam, veter the Vietnam veterans feel hard done by the people in my line of work and, th and are thus a little hesitant to tell their stories to someone like me. So I appreciate that, th that these men trusted me with what's probably their most prized possession their, their, the most exp their more, most important experiences. I, um, I had invited uh, Captain Jim Waybright, there, who was the company commander, to be here tonight with us, but he was, uh, he was unable to make it due to health concerns. Captain Waybright earned a silver star on May 10th, 1970 in the Mother's Day ambush. And he's represented Bravo Company several times, including at the uh, including at the White House for uh, Leslie Sabo's Medal of Honor ceremony in, in May of 2012. No, and uh, a few minutes ago I referred to this being 
this my this possibly being the second greatest honor I've ever received. The greatest was being referred to as a brother by the men of Bravo Company. Those men earned their right of brotherhood with their own blood and courage and the trauma of watching some of their best friends, some of the best friends they would ever have die on the battlefield. And for them to bestow that, for them to bestow that status upon me is overwhelming and humbling. Since Captain Waybright can't be here, I, I know he would, I know he would want me to do this one thing to recognize the soldiers from Bravo Company who, in spite of their comrades' best efforts, never made it home. And so I'll do so now. Peter Guzman of Los Angeles, Frank Madrid of Puerto de Luna, New Mexico, John Schaefer of Syracuse, New York, killed in action January 28, 1970. Joe Honan of Scranton, Pennsylvania, killed in action February 17th. Alan Johnson of Medford, Massachusetts, died February 25th, 1970, of wounds sustained February 17th. Gary Weekly of Middleborn, West Virginia, killed in action April 4th, 1970. Richard Calderon of Silver Bell, Arizona, and Thomas Scarborough of Asheville, North Carolina, killed in action April 8th, 1970. Bobby Kohler of Philadelphia, killed in action April 27th, 1970. And killed in action May 10th, 1970, Larry DeBoer of Grand Rapids, Michigan, James DeBrew of Whitakers, North Carolina, Fred Harms of Bartonville, Illinois, Thomas Merriman of Paulding, Ohio, Ernie Moore of Silver Lake, Michigan, Donald Smith of Rantola, Illinois, Leslie Joe Wilbanks of, Gil of Healy Bend, Arizona, and Medal of Honor recipient Leslie H. Sabo Jr. of Elwood City, Pennsylvania. I've deliberately left one name off that list because that's where we're going to start. That's where we're going to start tonight. Stephen Dial, and you'll you'll see his picture coming up, coming up here on the on the on the sir, on the slideshow. He'll be the one. He's going to be the one sitting facing the sitting at the lower at the lower left hand part of the screen facing the camera with the plate full of food in his hand. Caught, Stephen Dye, in that picture, Stephen Dye was caught in one of his natural habitats, eating. His comrades nicknamed him Hungry because he, was constant, he would constantly finish his own food and catch, and catch sea rations off, off his buddies, even the dreaded ham and lima beans. Oh, I hear some. I hear some Vietnam veterans laughing out there at the Hamilton Lima beans. So, Hungry Dial grew up not far from here. There he is, right there. Hungry Dial grew up not far from here in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. He was buried in in Shippensburg, not far from here. When a few months ago, when Bravo Company held its reunion in in Gettysburg, we a couple of us went to his went to visit his grave. He lost his father at a very young age, and as the oldest child, inherited man of the house responsibilities. He, he helped support his family by working at a golf course near his home as a caddy. And he was devoted to his mother. Every year on her birthday, he'd, he'd use money he earned caddying to buy her a cake. And like a lot of teenagers growing up in the mid-1960s, he was enamored with the music of the Beatles. In early 1969, he joined Bravo Company and was nearing the end of his combat tour as a, re as a respected leader on January 28th when the 3rd Platoon of Bravo Company was assigned to collect the bodies of U.S. soldiers from another, from another unit killed in action a few days earlier. That was a hazardous duty because the North Vietnamese knew their American foes refused to leave their fallen behind. And, and now I'm going to read a selection from Company of Heroes about the the am ambush on January 28, 1970, which was for Leslie Sabo and and several other soldiers who several other soldiers who arrived who had arrived in Vietnam in November and December of 1969. This was their first combat action. After advancing uphill along the slope of 474, Jack Bricky found what Bravo Company had gone there for: the body of one of their fallen comrades. <laughs> 
The discovery called for caution. It was common for the enemy to booby trap fallen US soldiers because they knew that other Americans would return to claim their bodies. As it happened, there was a trap awaiting 3rd Platoon, but it wasn't planted on the body of the fallen Delta Company soldier. Bricky looped the string around the soldier's wrist and flipped him over with sufficient vigor to ensure that a booby trap would be tripped if there was one. There wasn't. They collected the body, wrapped in a Reuben Ruda's poncho, and put it onto a chopper. Acting on Jagger's orders, 3rd Platoon began to withdraw. But instead of retracing their original route, which had skirted a ravine at Hill 474's base, the Currahees went right down Broadway, into the ravine center where the enemy, unbeknownst to them, lay in wait. Mad Madrid, who had turned 25 a month earlier and had been in Vietnam since the previous May, was killed immediately, along with Guzman and Schaefer. Bricky, who was with Guzman, Schaefer, and Madrid in the lead group, was raked across the back with machine gun fire. He fell across the body of Schaefer, who had been hit in the head. They just opened up, Bricky said. That was the fuse, and they just lit us up. There were rounds all over. It was like the 4th of July. Jerry Nash, the medic who had been in Vietnam a little more than a month and was facing his first combat action, rushed into hostile fire to treat the wounded. Hungry Dial, known to his comrades for as much for being fearless as he was for his unquenchable maw, came roaring over an enormous boulder in an effort to cover the medic's advance. Dial found Bricky, wounded, unable to stand, but still alive and still able to fight. In the shadow of the giant rock facing the enemy, Dial propped Bricky and backs to, the sh backs to the boulder and shoulder to shoulder, they hosed down the machine gun rounds with their M16s. At first they called for Guzman, who had been armed with a weapon that fired buckshot to spray ammunition across a wide area, but Guzman was already dead. So the Currahees yelled for the grenade launcher and its operator. Further back in the column, Rick Brown, armed with the M79 grenade launcher, and I'll, I'll stop here, Rick Brown, Rick Brown will come up in this cycle too, I'll, I'll point him out if I'm, I'll point him out when I notice. Armed with the M79 grenade launcher was about to face combat for the first time. Not far away from Brown was Ruben Ruda, who understood what Brown was going through because he had experienced it months earlier. The first time we took fire, I remember the rounds going over my head and the buttons of my shirt were the only things keeping me off the ground, Ruda said. He crawled into the ravine and ducked behind the boulder. On the other side, Brown crawled into the ravine and ducked behind the boulder. On the other side was Bricky, wounded but nonetheless able to direct Brown as he lobbed grenades into the North Vietnamese positions. Brown fired his grenades into the jungle at Bricky's direction throughout the firefight, but it would be 40 years before the either man discovered the other's identity. He fired every round he had, Bricky said, of Brown's work with the grenade launcher, but the North Vietnamese machine guns remained in place and they kept firing on what was left of Bravo Company's lead element. Nash, the medic who had worried about how he would react when, called, when he was called on to give aid under fire, moved toward the machine gun without hesitation. Hungry Dial was virtually at his side as they moved toward Bricky, who was severely wounded, and Schaefer, Madrid, and Guzman, who were already dead, although Nash insisted on ver verifying that for himself. Lay down a base of fire for Doc, Dial yelled. Put out the fire. Sitting against the boulder, Dial and Bricky unloaded their M16s toward the enemy machine gun nests. In the midst of their shooting, a machine gun bullet ricocheted off the stock of Bricky's rifle and hit Dial in the head, killing him instantly. The shot also de destroyed Bricky's weapon, leaving him to work strictly as a spotter for Brown. Nash ascertained that four of the five men caught on the wrong side of the, that boulder were dead. Having already lost four patients on his first day of combat, Nash worked like hell to save the fifth. He stemmed the bleeding from Bricky's back, left arm, left leg, and torso, and gave co copious amounts of morphine. The last measure might have been important to as important to saving the soldier's life as controlling the blood flow was. The medic slapped a morphine injection into Bricky's leg. Within moments, the pain from Bricky's horrific wounds, a broken bone on his lower left leg was ex exposed, dissipated, to be re replaced with euphoria and a sense of indestructibility. Bricky was thinking in fluent bra bravado. He just slapped it like that, Bricky said of the morphine dose. I was like, give me a weapon and I'll dust his ass. Then, with the machine gun fire continuing, Nash hefted Bricky over that massive boulder. Years later, both men would joke that they made it over the giant rock under heavy fire only because the medic used Bricky as a shield. The North Vietnamese pushed their attack and chased off a medevac helicopter, so the Americans sent in a gunship, which made a single pass over the ravine and riddled the jungle with, en with, with, en with machine gun fire. The enemy machine guns went silent. The he comes in and makes a pass, and he just lit the place up 
Bricky subsequently remembered. After making that pass, the gunship moved in to retrieve Bricky. Nash and Brown heaved him onto the helicopter, where he landed, back first on the craft's ammunition stores, as the metal ammo box dug into his back wound. The resulting pain penetrated Bricky's morphine euphoria, and the soldier thought he'd been hit again. But the drug-induced fog and trauma would reclaim him. The next thing he remembered was being at a medical hospital, a military hospital in Japan. With the enemy's machine gun crossfire silenced, the remaining Bravo Company troopers could retreat out of danger. Dial would receive a posthumous silver star. In life, the Chambersburg native had taught the, newer, the newest Bravo Company soldiers how to survive in Vietnam. In death, his sacrifice set the unit standard. Dial was one of the first Bravo Companies to die for his comrades in Vietnam, but he wouldn't be the last. He's why I'm here today, Bricky said more than 40 years later, him and Doc Nash. Meanwhile, Brown, who was only 18 years old, was dealing with the death of his mentor, Madrid. He just took me under his wing, Brown would say later. It hurt me when he was killed. One of the, as, as someone who never served in the military, I, I, I turned 10 years old the month that Saigon fell. This, and I'm a, I, as a professional storyteller and newspaper reporter, I learned so much from the Meta Bravo Company, from, ta from talking to them and having them share their story with me. Because when, when you haven't faced combat, there's a tendency to think it's like the movies. It's, it's when you talk to people who've actually watched their friends die that you realize how much, how much of it is self-sacrifice and how, the, how men like Stephen Dial and Leslie Sabo gave their lives for their comrades. But it was also in, in the little things uh, like when, like Rick Brown referring to uh, to Frank Madrid as one of as his mentor, the way that the leaders like Stephen Dial, who had been who had been in in country for a year, and Frank Madrid, would teach the FNGs, the the for those of you who weren't in Vietnam, that's a that's a not safe for work acronym for newly or newly arrived infantrymen. Rick Brown, always, Rick Brown used to talk about how Madrid would teach him little things like how to pack your, how to pack your bag. Because it's not something that you think about until you have to do it. That, that, you, that when you're carrying 70 to 140 pounds on your back, depending on what your duty is, you don't want to have a sea ration can jabbing you in the ribs with every step. And it was, it's silly things like that that you don't think about until you have to do it or until somebody like Frank Madrid tells you, hey, don't do that. And Dial set an example for his comrades, especially the guys who, who were facing combat for the first time. With four, with four of his buddies caught on the wrong side of the boulder, he could have stayed, he could have stayed on the safe side but he chose not to. He went over. He went over to the dangerous side, to the dangerous side of the of the shelter, and he lost his life. It set a standard, one that would save lives four months later in Cambodia. It, it taught them, and it taught the new guys that the real mission wasn't necessarily killing North Vietnamese but it was making sure as many of their comrades as possible got back home. The ambush at the, at the boulder along for, Hill 474 is one of the stories in Company of Heroes. But sometimes a story is more than a story. Sometimes a story contributes to a narrative. Narratives are powerful things. Once a narrative is established, it's like a boulder rolling downhill. It's moving fast, it's hard to stop, travels on its own momentum, nearly impossible to redirect, 
and it's liable to crush anything that gets in its way. Good stories, properly and honestly told, yield good, yield good narratives. Bad stories need to lead to bad narratives. And the Vietnam War's narratives profoundly affected the men who served in that conflict and might even have had an impact on the outcome. The best narratives come from good stories. With that in mind, nonfiction storytellers like me have it easier than our fiction writing counterparts, at least when it comes to realistic fiction, where a novelist and a short story writer is con constrained by what's possible. A nonfiction writer or a journalist gets, is free to write about anything that actually happened. Because the story of Leslie Halash Sabo, born February 22, 1948, and died May 10, 1970, is too improbable to have been fiction. His father was a government official in, during World War II in Hungary, a country that was allied with Germany. His uncle was a member of the cabinet of Prime Minister Nicholas Clay and might have been part of a secret envoy to, that, met with, that met in 1944 with Winston Churchill to discuss a separate peace agreement with the Allies. That action in turn, is, that action in turn led, led Hitler to install an arrow cross puppet government in Hungary in 1944. That year, with the, with, the, with the Nazis ruling in Hungary and the, Soviets, and the Soviets bearing down on the country, Leslie Sabo's parents and his older brother walked out of Hungary into Austria. While, he, while the family lived in Austria, Sabo, Sa Leslie Sabo was born. The family, eventually, the family emigrated to the United States which itself was a was was an almost improbable it was an almost improbable instance. They were scheduled to uh, to have gone on a ship to Australia, which which was starting a uh, which was starting a program to give uh, farmland to refugees. However, both Leslie and his older brother came down with whooping cough and were quarantined and missed their boat. The next boat was to the next ship out of Europe was to the United States. They settled in the western Pennsylvania steel town of Elwood City. Leslie Sabo's older brother, George, and there's, there's a wedding picture of, from 1969 with Leslie in his dress greens and his brother standing next to him. That'll, that'll be coming around shortly. His older brother, George, graduated from Elwood City Lincoln High School in 1961 with future rock star Donnie Iris. Leslie Sabo himself graduated in 1966, and in between, the family took the oath of U.S. citizenship. After graduating from high school, Leslie Sabo attended Youngstown State University but dropped out to work in a steel mill, which left him vulnerable to the draft. Uncle Sam called for him in 1969. By the time Leslie Sabo and dozens of other FNGs were assigned to Bravo Company late that year, the U.S. strategy in Vietnam had shifted at least nominally from body count, the campaign to kill North Vietnamese troops and Viet Cong irregulars faster than they could be replaced, to Vietnamization, training and equipping the Republic of North Vietnam to fight its own war while we prepared to withdraw. And I qualified that statement with the word nominally because the ramifications, some of the ramifications of body count were still in force, as, as the men of Bravo Company would, would tell me. One, one Bravo Company soldier wrote in his journal that a, the battalion command gave, him one, gave a group one of the most treasured of all prizes, a day off the line at a, beach par, at a beach party. The only people eligible were the ones who had at least one confirmed kill during the previous period. Captain Waybright said body count still went a long way in determining which captains were promoted to major and which majors were promoted to lieutenant colonel, and also that he had decided to leave the military after his combat tour, so the threat of promotions denied and the promise of promotions won were neither a stick nor a carrot to motivate him to accumulate dead enemy soldiers. Instead, Captain Waybright said his motivation was to bring home as many of the men under his command as possible, which itself reflected a certain frustration on the combat troops with the policy makers and, their, and with their South Vietnamese allies. One, one soldier wrote in his journal after an operation, we were, we were supposed to be a blocking force with the Vietnamese, but when the shit hit the fan, they left. Other Bravo Company soldiers hinted that some, vill some villagers were allied with the Americans in daylight, 
in the North Vietnamese at night. And all of, all of this contributed to a narrative that took place among the soldiers that their military and political leaders were no longer trying to win the war, but simply disengage with dignity. Consequently, the men of Bravo Company were fighting less for their country or even to stem the tide of communism than they were for the man next to him. Having your comrade six is a time-honored part of the American military heritage, and it serves a tactical purpose. By creating a culture in which the combat infantryman places the well-being of his comrades above his own, the individual is inspired to hold the line longer than he might have if he were fighting for his own self-interest or even for his country. And that ethos might have been at its zenith during the Vietnam War. On May 10, 1970, two platoons from Bravo Company, including Sabos, were ambushed on the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia by a North Vietnamese unit several times larger than their own force. Uh, in, in May of 1970, the, American, the Americans launched an operation into Cambodia in an attempt to cut the supply lines along the supply lines on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It was quite possibly the most controversial operation of the entire war. It's what uh, spurred, it spurred protests on campuses all over America, including the one at, uh, including the one at Kent State in, in May of 1970 that resulted in four college students being killed by fire from the Ohio National Guard. On, you know, um, I'm, I'll be reading here from another, a selection from Company of Heroes about the about the Mother's Day ambush on, on May 10th, 1970. With Reuben Rue at a walking point, third platoon took the lead, followed by second platoon, including Leslie Sabo and George Koziel. And it didn't take them long to find trouble. Just after 3 p.m., the Americans moved into a jungle clearing with sparse tree cover and a trail that ran down through the clearing center. Sabo's second squad of second platoon had just broken out of the tree line when, in Koziel's words, the shit hit the fan. In the lead element, Ruta immediately saw signs that the clearing was in fact inhabited, with punji sticks and hooches along the perimeter. As he neared the huts, Ruta saw enemy soldiers pouring out of them. The instincts that had served him so well in, in the tunnels of Hill 474 and on the Crow's Foot trails were screaming out a warning. A guy came out with a rifle. He ran into the woods, followed by another guy, Ruta said. He began returning fire. I was, stand, I was standing there like John Wayne, until a lieutenant said, stop shooting and get down. That would have been Teb Stocks, who was the only lieutenant in the clearing, with, with Lawrence Neff having been wounded and lifted out days earlier, and John Green's first platoon back down the trail. Ruta complied with the order and got onto his belly in a, in a small depression. Every time I went to get up, I could see the rounds going over my head. Were I a little higher, I wouldn't be here. I couldn't see more than 10 feet, and everyone was shooting. Back in the column, the other Currahees were doing the same. We had very little cover. We walked into an open area, Koziel said. Once we were in the whole middle area, they opened up on us. The attack started just as Sabo's squad, which was at the column's tail end, entered the clearing. Koziel's squad was about 10 meters ahead of Sabo's when the Currahees were hit from three sides by a much larger North Vietnamese force. The enemy had, had not only the advantage of numbers, but was also dug into defensive positions from the cover of a surrounding tree line and able to fire down on, the, down on the Americans who were caught out in an open area. They were actually in trees and behind trees and pretty well wrapped around us. Estimates of the enemy force ranged from 100 soldiers to 400 to 500. And they were pouring hot lead down on the Currahees who scrambled for whatever small amount of cover was available. There was little vegetation in the clearing and the trees and shrubs were no taller than, four, than five feet, so they offered little protection. The encircling jungle was surrounded by trees upwards of 40 feet tall, and the enemy soldiers were entrenched behind cover and even fired rockets and AK-47s rounds down on the Americans from high in the tree branches. Brown, in second platoon, tried to find shelter behind a large anthill, but didn't know where to hide because the gunfire seemed to be coming from all directions, which it was. For about five seconds, that's an eternity, we were too busy scurrying for cover. I felt we froze just a bit to get our bearings, then we returned fire with a vengeance. The enemy was everywhere. We went for whatever cover we could find, Richard Rios said. With all the shooting going on, and the dust and the guns, everything was a haze. Toward the column's front, up with third platoon, that haze concealed much of what was going on. The exposed Currahees were on the verge of being overrun from all directions. 
Rick Brown, one day after his 19th birthday, wasn't keen on his chances of ever seeing 20. As he hugged the ground and looked unsuccessfully for concealment, Brown expected the rear guard would be quickly overrun, which would have freed the enemy to finish off everyone who was left. As the fighting continued, Koziel dropped behind the southern tr southeast tree line, which brought him into close contact with his friend Leslie Sabo. As Sabo headed for the jungle's relative safety, he led a counterattack against, an against an enemy element that was attempting to close the pocket and completely surround the Americans. While Sabo would perform more spectacular acts of valor that day, none would be more vital to the Currahees' defense of their position. As he defended the, America's room, the Americans' rearmost element, Lieutenant Teb Stocks, 3rd Platoon's leader, was trying to stabilize the situation and maintain a connection between the two platoons. Stocks was concerned that, that the North Vietnamese would pour into a gap between the two U.S. elements. He and Sergeant John Roethlisberger moved to shore up the Currahees' defense under heavy enemy fire, a, an effort that, that, by Stocks' own admission, succeeded primarily because of Sabo. If it hadn't been for him holding his side of the perimeter almost single-handedly so I could reinforce his position, we would have been overrun. In the rear guard on the clearing southeast corner, Sabo was leading as efforts to stabilize Bravo Company's rear perimeter and kept the smaller exposed U.S. force from being surrounded, overrun, and annihilated. Certainly, Sabo wasn't the only person in Bravo Company to, to fend off the North Vietnamese flanking element. In the rear guard, there was no shortage of valor. With 2nd Platoon under a withering attack, one soldier, likely Leslie Wilbanks or Thomas Merriman, exposed himself to provide fire, covering fire until the enemy cut him down and Donald Smith attacked an enemy machine gun bunker with grenades. Smith silenced the gun, but the assault cost him his life. James DeBrew and Ernie Moore manned one of, platoon, one of second platoon's M60 machine guns. The following morning, their bodies would still be found, would be found still at the weapon. Larry DeBoer wa ran into the open field under heavy fire to rescue a wounded comrade. Sabo, Smith, the machine gun team of DeBrew and Moore DeBoer and Wilbanks kept the North Vietnamese out of the clearing. If they had gotten around them, I was easy pickings, Brown said. They kept me alive. As the shooting continued, Lieutenant Steb Teb Stocks and Sergeant Little John Roethlisberger moved back toward the rear element to set up a defensible perimeter until help arrived and prevented the enemy from driving a wedge between second and third platoons. That action was a matter of instinct for Stocks, who had no communication with the rest of Bravo Company or outside support because his radio telephone operator, Specialist Frederick Harms, was seriously wounded early in the battle. Stocks regarded Harms as one of the most dependable men in his platoon. Not long after taking command of 3rd Platoon, Stocks, an Atlanta native, said he quickly found himself on the receiving end of Harms' sense of humor. When Harms was assigned as 3rd Platoon's radioman, Stocks said the Bartonville, Illinois native told him it was because Captain Waybright couldn't understand the lieutenant's southern twang. But the platoon commander came to depend on Harms until May 10th. I knew something was wrong when I reached for my radio and he wasn't, and it wasn't there, Stocks said. From his vantage point, Stocks saw that just about everyone was scurrying for cover. For those like Ruta who couldn't find any, the lieutenant ordered them to hug the dirt like their lives depended on it, because they did. And everyone complied with that order with one exception. Under withering fire from the trees, Sabo was on his feet, shooting back. Stocks yelled at Sabo. I was cussing at that son of a bitch, telling him to get down. And he just looked at me and grinned. As the battle raged on, the Americans heard and saw their comrades' dying moments. In the column's lead, point man Reuben Ruda was pressing his body into a shallow, grassy depression. With bullets flying inches above his head, Ruda had trouble seeing anything, but he could hear everything and the sound tormented him. Ruta could hear Les Wilbanks, one of his closest friends in Bravo Company, mortally wounded and calling for help. Years later, Ruta would remember his friend's final moments. He was more serious than the rest of us were, Ruta said. I remember him calling for a medic. I was thinking, they killed my buddy. This has got to be a dream. Jerry Nash had been 3rd Platoon's medic but was transferred to Bravo Company's headquarters platoon a few weeks before the Cambodian operation. Also, two other medics became patients themselves when struck, when struck by North Vietnamese fire. Now, which, left Nash as, which left Nash as the only source of medical care. With enemy fire raking clearing, 
Nash moved from one wounded man to another, doing his best with dwindling surprise to offer treatment and hope, even for those beyond hope. Don't let me die, a wounded soldier said. A badly wounded soldier cried out as Nash hovered over him. Please don't let me die. Nash lied to him. We're not going to let you die, the medic said, even as he knew the man wouldn't survive. Koziel, who had been retreating toward the tree line, had a close-up view as Sabo engaged the, North, the advancing North Vietnamese with rifle fire and grenades. When an injured soldier was caught out in the open, Sabo moved directly into the enemy attack. It was the same thing he had done a month earlier during the ambush in Binh Dinh province when Scarborough was killed. Koziel said Sabo was motivated by the same instinct in both cases. When he saw a guy wounded, he went to help, Koziel said. While the enemy was attacking his position on May 10th, Sabo once again went to help. The injured man who had just moments earlier been working with Koziel, Sabo, and the rest of 2nd Platoon to repel the North Vietnamese was lying exposed when an enemy soldier from a two-man trench threw a grenade that landed near the fallen Kurahi, who has still never been identified. Sabo moved forward and threw himself over the body of his comrade, absorbing multiple shrapnel injuries to his back in the process. What I recall was that Les ran out in the direction of the wounded soldier just as a grenade was thrown in that area, and he dove on the guy on the ground when the grenade exploded. I think Les got hit with shrapnel on the back, and the wounded soldier crawled to the tree line, because you wrote years later on the Bravo Company online message board. As the unidentified wounded soldier made his way to the relative safety of the wooded area, Sabo, who was by then badly wounded himself, went on the attack. He rushed the North Vietnamese trench with a grenade assault of his own and killed both enemy soldiers. By this time, late in the afternoon, several of Sabo's fellow 2nd Platoon Company soldiers were, were already injured or dead, and the Believer Bravo Company soldiers were running low on lead to throw at the North Vietnamese. Sabo, already injured from the earlier hand grenade attack, again exposed himself so he could strip ammunition magazines from Americans who had been killed earlier. He picked up two or three of them and threw one to me and one to another guy and ducked behind a tree. That's when he got hit in the leg. The clearing stayed open, albeit at a terrible cost, with seven second platoon soldiers dead or dying. But those men, through their sacrifice, brought the rest of, bought the rest of Bravo Company the precious of all commodities for an outnumbered, outgunned, and exposed military force. Time. Around 5 p.m., several hours after the ambush had begun, an artillery strike forced the North Vietnamese snipers out of the trees. Waybright said even that was fraught with peril. Bobby Garnto, the company commander's radio telephone operator, called in the artillery support from fire support base Curry, even though the enemy was so close to the Americans that any effective shelling would fall on comrades as well as enemies. He was concerned that he couldn't call it any closer because it ran the risk of hitting friendly forces, Waybright said. But the artillery brought to an end the North Vietnamese fire on Bravo Company's exposed forces. By that time, with 2nd Platoon decimated and ammunition virtually depleted, Sabo stood almost alone against the North Vietnamese, with, with Koziel having been injured earlier in the day and serving only as a witness to his friend's heroism. The air and, the air and artillery support didn't settle the issue. It just gave the Kurahis some breathing room. And even with Sabo stripping ammunition from his fallen comrades, they, the Americans were in danger of running out of bullets, an eventuality that would have been catastrophic. If they would have run, a, if they would have run out of ammunition, the, the North Vietnamese would have shot them right between the eyes. John, John Green, the, the platoon lieutenant for, for first platoon, was, heard, the, heard the battle from outside that clearing because they were held, they were held back in reserve and they were and to, guard the, uh, to guard the packs for the, other, for the other soldiers who were advancing. From their reserve perimeter, Green and the rest of 1st Platoon could hear the sounds of battle. From the radio, which blared forth Waybright's calls for artillery support, they could hear the situation within the clearing continue to, to deteriorate. The two platoons of Bravo Company that were still in the fight were, out, were outnumbered and caught relatively out in the open. Retreating from the clearing would have been fatal for most of the two dozen or so soldiers already wounded and unable to move. They couldn't get out. Reinforcements had to go in. The call fell to 1st Platoon. We carried as much as we could, one soldier said. We literally ran to their position. I thought that was going to be the last sunrise I'd see. I thought we were going to prove our loyalty to our brothers by dying alongside them. 
but John Green's force did have one circumstance working in its favor. After destroying a hospital facility a few hours earlier, the Currahees initially pursued the enemy southeast and then swung back to the northwest shortly before entering the clearing. As a result, 1st Platoon was at the opposite end of the clearing from Sabo and the rest of 2nd Platoon, an eventuality that would work to Green's advantage because it, was allow, it would allow his force of around 25 to 30 men to catch the enemy from behind. Speed and stealth were of prime importance because the Currahees had to cover about one kilometer and traverse an open field. It was dark when we went in, 1st Platoon Soldier Mike Tex Bowman said. We brought as much stuff as we, ca as we could carry. We had to go by sound. Green readied 1st Platoon for an advance on the clearing in near complete darkness, and then to immediately attack an enemy that still had the advantage of superior numbers while trying not to shoot any friendly troops. Initially, the tr in initially they advanced in a single column with Bill Watling at point. When 1st Platoon reached the open ground just outside the North Vietnamese ambush perimeter, Green split them into three columns for the final advance across a stretch where even one North Vietnamese soldier with a machine gun could have wiped out the entire platoon. But the approach of night provided cover, and the sound generated by the continuing battle was an ally. Waybright Way said the North Vietnamese, who probably still outnumbered 1st Platoon by a ratio of more than 5 to 1, likely thought Green's force was much larger than it actually was. I expected we would all be killed. The only advantage was that it was getting dark. We got across, we got across the field with, without anyone shooting at us, which amazed us. After crossing the clearing, Green and his men burst through the perimeter near Ruta's position in front of the main element across the clearing from 2nd Platoon. For Richard Rios, seeing 1st Platoon's arrival was like the cavalry arriving just in time in the old American Western movies he grew up watching back home in Texas. Green's men broke the siege only to take fire from helicopter gunships whose pilots were unaware that the clearing was now being taken by Americans. At a few hundred feet elevation at speeds approaching 100 miles an hour, the Currahees pouring into the clearing were indistinguishable from the North Vietnamese who had threatened to overrun it all afternoon. However, the North Vietnamese were able to tell the difference. Soon, 1st Platoon was taking fire from both friendly helicopters and decidedly unfriendly troops on the ground. A radio call by Waybright to the choppers solved the first problem, but not the second. The bullets started popping over and I realized I should be crawling instead of walking, Green said. It was up to the very same soldiers who had spent hours fighting for their lives to secure, who, to secure a safe landing zone for the helicopters to land in near darkness at the outer end of their fuel range. A task that took on vital importance because there were almost 30 injured soldiers who couldn't wait for daylight for medical treatment. And even though first platoon's attack and the onset of night broke the enemy's opportunity to overrun Bravo Company, the North Vietnamese still posed a real threat to harass any helicopter coming into the clearing. Green found a suitable landing site near the area where second platoon, which had absorbed most of the casualties, was still pinned down. While the, while the helicopters, known as, popularly known as Ueys, were, no, were, regarded for their, were highly regarded for their durability, they were still vulnerable to ground fire, as was shown earlier in the day when the North Vietnamese shot down a helicopter that was to have brought troops from Alpha Company of the 506th to lift the attack against Bravo Company. The landing zone was barely adequate. It was surrounded by jungle and not much wider than the radius of a, of a UE's main rotor, which, mean, which meant that the evacuation helicopters had to descend almost vertically into the, into the landing zone, which in turn meant that each approach and departure would require more time and greater exposure to enemy fire than it would if the choppers could make a more horizontal approach. The two machine gun emplacements had already had the planned landing zone caught in a crossfire. Already, Green could hear the voices of his wounded comrades calling out for water to replace some of the fluids they had lost through their own blood and sweat, even before the first helicopter cruised in to pick up Cozy and another wounded soldier at the not quite secure battle landing zone. From behind the tree line, enemy soldiers began firing on the helicopter. Green, who was among the troops trying to secure a patch of ground for the landing zone, said the combination of fire from close in and, and off in the distance thwarted the Americans' efforts even as the first aircraft headed in. One of the helicopter crewmen was hit in the arm while helping cozy onto the aircraft. The enemy continued to attack the helicopter as it was take, lifting off. I remember someone pulling me into the medevac helicopter. Then I must have passed out, cozy said. When I came to, we were in the air, and it seemed like red and green tracer bullets were were coming in all directions. And then Sabo did something extraordinary again. <laughs> 
He stepped out from behind a small tree, which for hours had been his only cover, and squeezed the trigger on his rifle, which he had set to full automatic. Sabo probably didn't know about the helicopter that had been shot down earlier in the day, but he knew if this one went down, his fellow Kurahis would have been on board. Perhaps he made a calculation, counting the few, counting the few seconds before his, random, before his weapon ran dry. Perhaps he knew it would be enough. Or perhaps Sabo just acted instinctively to protect his comrades. Whatever the case, his attack stopped the enemy machine guns and allowed 1st Platoon to eliminate the single enemy soldier in the landing zone. It also gave the helicopter time to carry his injured friend from the battlefield. He stood up, Green said. Until he did that, we couldn't get up and secure that landing zone. I couldn't believe Leslie didn't stood up like that. Sure made a difference. Mike Tex Bowman, who was in the clearing by that time, but but missed seeing Sabo's earlier acts of heroism, would later be amazed that Sabo was able to stand up, much less cover the helicopter landing. He got hit two or three times, but still kept on going. Sabo was able to clear the landing zone, but the 22-year-old soldier paid for that real estate with his own blood. For hours, after, single, after almost single-handedly preventing the North Vietnamese from wiping out dozens of American soldiers, Sabo was, valuable, was vulnerable while he reloaded. And when the enemy soldiers were able to poke their heads and their weapons back into the open, they took advantage of that opportunity. When Sabo stopped shooting, the enemy fired on him in clear view of Cozio, then en route to a field hospital. I saw him when he dropped, when he dropped his rifle, fell to, dropped to his knees, and fell face down in the dust. Survivors of the Mother's Day ambush unanimously reported that 2nd Platoon's counterattack, and particularly Sabo's repeated heroic acts, saved their own lives, even if they didn't realize it at the time. All Rick and Brown knew as the sun beat down and the enemy remained, remained, rained hot lead on them from all directions was that he expected the North Vietnamese to emerge from the trees at any moment to kill him, but they never showed themselves. I couldn't work out why they couldn't get around that corner, he said. Only later he, did he find out that the North Vietnamese couldn't get at him because Leslie Sabo owned the corner. Sabo was immediately re recommended for the Medal of Honor, but the documentation went missing for almost 30 years until 1999 when a fellow Vietnam veteran found Sabo's long lost file entirely by accident. In contact of the soldiers who served with Sabo and government officials to restart the effort and see Sabo recognized for his valor, an effort that came to fruition on May, on May 17, 2012, when President Barack Obama awarded him the nation's most prestigious military award. In the first five months of 1970, Bravo Company lost 18 men in a, killed in action. During the rest of that year, it lost none. As, as, can, as the United States continued its drawdown of combat troops and, and, the, and the campaign season came to an end. By the end of that year, most of the men who'd survived the, Bravo, the, most of the, men who'd survived the Mother's Day ambush fi had finished their tours and gone home. But the Bravo Company veterans, like many of those who had survived, survived, served in Vietnam, were left in a historical sour spot. Afflicted with survivor's guilt from having made it home because other men didn't, still coming to terms with, with the deaths of some of the closest friends they would ever have, they returned home to a country that was, that was apathetic at best and hostile at worst about their pain. They returned with, an, with a... With, a, with an emotional ailment, post-traumatic stress disorder that didn't even really have a name, much less a treatment. Bravo Company veteran Rick Clanton, who, who remembers being told not to wear his uniform through the airport after he got off his Freedom Bird flight back to the world, said he felt less secure in some ways because he came home. And to quote, for the first time in a year, someone didn't have my back. For another veteran, Rick Brown, the issue was anger. Fortunately, he had an employer who understood and told him, if you get angry, just take a walk around the block. Some of their marriages crumbled, and many of those marriages that survived did so only with great difficulty. Few stayed in the Army, but most of the Bravo Company veterans muddled along, detached from the most important thing they had ever done and the most important people they had ever known. More than 30 years after, after Bravo Company returned from Vietnam, Leslie Sabo's story reemerged just as they were ready to talk about their long ago combat experiences with the only people who could, who could have truly understood them. <laughs>
when Leslie Sabo's military records were rediscovered in the National Archives, along with his unacted upon Medal of Honor citation, a 100, another 101st, another 101st Airborne Division veteran named Tony Mab, the man who found those documents, took it upon himself to kickstart the long dormant effort to see, to, to, to have a man he never knew, a man he didn't serve with, recognized for his heroism. And the way he did it helped heal, helped heal the helped heal some of the men who served with Sabo, and it helped heal his family as well. Leslie Sabo's father and namesake died in 1977 without ever knowing that his, that his son died so that other men could live. His mother, widow, and brothers were all still alive, but none of them knew how Les, exactly how Leslie Sabo died. In, in Sabo's hometown, Du several stories went around about what happened to him. And when I, when I first started telling Leslie Sabo's story, there were, there were, two, there were two groups of, there were two groups of people. Who, well, when I, when, I tell, when I told his story to people who knew him in Elwood City growing up, they would, they would say, they, they would say, well, I'd expect, I expected him to do something like that. I expected him to sacrifice himself, his life for other people. Because that's the kind of kid he was. That's how he was when he was. That's how he was when he was a little boy. That's how he was when he was a teenager. That's how that. That's how he was when he was he was grown up. They were surprised that the, they were surprised that his records went missing for thirty years. And when I tell the story to a Vietnam veteran, they were they're they're mildly surprised that uh, they're mildly surprised that he did that he went to such extraordinary lengths. They weren't surprised his records went missing. Half the, time, half the time I tell this story to Vietnam veterans, they go, yeah, they lost my records too. You should, see the, you, should, you should see the trouble I had getting the VA to approve my benefits. So after, so after, after Tony Mab found, the, uh, found Sabo's records, he started reaching out to the men of Bravo Company. And those men started reaching out to each other for the first time in 30 years. In 2003, Bravo Company began having annual reunions. And earlier this year, as I said, uh, and it's it's been my honor to have been invited to these to these reunions. Uh, in 2014, I drove I drove with my with my son to uh, from. Western Pennsylvania to Branson, Missouri, and back in in less than two days, just so I could see them for a few hours. There's some because they, you know, my my dad was a World War II veteran, and the they, and there there are people who call his uh, his generation the greatest generation, but for my money, the Vietnam the Vietnam generation was the the guys who served in Vietnam were pretty great themselves, at least the ones I've met. And led by Rick Clanton and Rick Brown, they, they started reaching out to the families of the guys who didn't come home. And as I said, in 2003, they started having, they started having reunions again, and they prepared for one final battle to see their long-ago comrade receive the, the recognition he deserved. And in the end, Leslie Sabo helped, helped save his comrades again by allowing them to, by allowing them to come to terms with what had happened, what they had done, with 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 how with how they had served their country, and how they hadn't been, how they all hadn't been recognized for it. Uh, one of the guys uh, whom I've mentioned in the who I've mentioned in the readings, Ruben Ruda. He he was on. On uh, January 28th, in the in the battle where Stephen Dial was killed, he was his his best friend Jack Bricky was badly wounded and airlifted out, and for 42 years, Ruda didn't know what had ha what had happened to to Br to Jack Bricky. In 
in 2012, he went to his first reunion, the one at the White House, uh, for Sabo's Medal of Honor ceremony. And that day, he saw Jack Brickey for the first time. For 42 years, Ruben Rota had, had nightmares about his time in Vietnam. After he saw Jack Brickey again, the nightmares stopped. Bravo Company during late 1969 and early 1970 was one of many similar units that saw that saw action during the Vietnam War. And even they changed on a nearly daily basis as the as they as men were transferred in and out. But in some ways Bravo Company was unique. Not every company had its own Medal of Honor recipient, for one. Two Bravo Company veterans, Michael DeLeo and Ben Curran in a division that was already transitioning from its traditional function as an airborne force to an air assault division, qualified for the Army's elite Golden Knights parachute team. The battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Jaggers, would finish his career as a major general and earn induction into the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. But in some ways, the story of Bravo Company is emblematic of a more universal Vietnam experience. <coughs> Bravo Company, unlike their World War II pre precursors, didn't train together and they didn't ship out together. When they returned, they came home, in the words of Rick Clanton, in onesies and twosies. When they returned, they left behind comrades in unfinished work. When they, returned, they, when they returned home, they returned home to an unsympathetic public that had consumed reports of death and killing. A few years later, when North Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese, that public saw it as their failure. It would be decades before that narrative would change, before we realized that Vietnam combat veterans performed just as honorably and effectively as Vietnam vet, as infantrymen have done before and since. And I, I, tell, I, tell this, I tell this to people all the time, and I've, I've written it in the newspaper, that if veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan feel as though Americans supported them when they were deployed, and that they were welcomed home, they should thank a Vietnam veteran because it's a reflection that, those, that the Vietnam veterans were treated shabbily when they came home, and of Americans' determination to never again blame the troops for the politicians' mistakes. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a few moments here for uh, questions and answers. Uh, again, please raise your hand and we'll bring the, uh, the microphones around to you. Does anybody have a question? Did they ever tell you why they were in Cambodia? Was, it, was there a specific reason to be there? Well, there was the official reason and the unofficial reason. Um, no, nominally, it was supposed, nominally, I guess it was supposed to cut support lines, but the, the, the other answer, I guess, is because they could, because, the, um, because of the coup that had happened in, earlier that year in Cambodia that, that allowed a, a, a more, that put a more America, a more U.S. friendly, a more U.S. friendly leadership in place. And that, that, that and, and that the North Vietnamese had begun to threaten that, the new, the new regime. But re really, I think I think if you ask if you ask anybody, they'll say it's uh, in, and I um, uh, Gen General H R McMaster's book, um, Dereliction of Duty, and in it they they kind of that was one of the things that that they said probably should have been done to have a greater impact earlier in the war when it when it might have when it might have mattered. Do we have another question? Right here in front. Thank you very much for honoring Laszlo, Le Leslie Sabo and his buddies in the, in the company. I have a, a brief question, and then I'd like to get into a more substantive matter, please. Uh, one of your images 
indicates uh, your book with your autograph and inscriptions from Secretary McHugh and General Odierno to Rose. Who is Rose? Is it the widow or? Rose, Rose is Leslie Sabo's widow, and actually that, that was my self-published book because the, uh, it, it came out in 2009. And uh, the, the, other, the other autograph is actually the president. Oh, well, the pre the president. Yes, that's that's how I that's that's how I that's how I got my book deal, for for the for Company of Heroes, the uh, the packet that I sent out to, um, the packet that I sent out to publishers, included a cover letter, a synopsis, and the picture the picture of my self published book autographed by the president of the United States. That's quite quite remarkable. Uh, my my other question: You said that for so many decades his file had been lost. Where was it lost? In St. Louis, in Suitland, in archives too. It, Do we know where I, it went astray? And it was it was in the College Park archives, okay. is where it was found. But just misfiled within the battalion I, papers or division papers or where misfiled? I'm I'm not sure. I do, but I do have a theory on that. That that the um, the Cambo the Cambodian operation was ba was basically a fourth infantry division affair. H however, um, excuse me, um, and uh, this this is this is covered in um, in the book into Cambodia. One of the one of the battalion there there was a hell just before the just before the jump for that. One of the fourth division battalion's uh, helicopters was shot down and it wiped out the entire battalion leadership. It, um, so ra instead of um, instead of sending that battalion in with uh, inexperienced leadership, they plugged in the third of the 506th because it was it, it actually from January until July of 1970, the third of the 506th was not attached to the rest of the 101st Airborne. So I kind I, I kind of think, and a couple of guys from Bravo Company agree with me that. The Medal of Honor, the Sabo's Medal of Honor documentation, made it as far as brigade or maybe in divi even division level, and the Fourth Division said, "Well, he's 101st Airborne; they'll take care of it." 101st Airborne said, "Well, that's a fourth, that's a fourth infantry division in operation; they'll take care of it." And it, it, and there, were, and with with all the other chaos that was going on, it, I, it wasn't advanced beyond then. I, as far I, I don't. I'm not sure what happened to it between the time that George Cozy wrote the original Medal of Honor citation, and the time it was discovered in 1999 by, by Tony Mab. Do we have another question? Uh, what was your inspiration for writing the book? Well. Um, I, I, I work at a newspaper in Leslie Sabo's hometown, and I, and I was telling this story earlier at dinner. My, my wife is a registered nurse, and when she buys her nursing pants, she likes, she likes to have them done real tight down around the calves. So, I have, so whenever we buy her nursing pants, we have, to get them, we have to get them altered at the seamstress shop. So I was picking up a couple pairs of her nursing pants at the seamstress shop one day, and uh, I w um, down in downtown Elwood City, such as it is. And as I was walking out of the building, walking in was a woman named Charlotte Price. And uh, Charlotte uh, is Charlotte's husband is a Pennsylvania State Trooper, and her son's wife is a is a friend of my wife, so she knows me. Plus, I I, I have one of the more recognizable faces in a small town. So people are always coming up to me to pitch, pitch story ideas. And she says, my friend's husband was killed in Vietnam, me, me referring to Rose. My friend's husband was killed in Vietnam, and now he's up for the Medal of Honor. Now, I, I, had, I had been a, a, an amateur military historian. My dad died when I was six, so I read a lot of World War II stuff to kind of connect with the father that I'd lost. And... I didn't believe her. I thought, because I I'd read Medal of Honor citations. I I know what it takes to get. I I mean I I know what other people what people have done to get the Medal of Honor. And it it astounded me that that it, this was in March of two thousand seven. 
So it just astounded me that that some the uh, the heroism of that magnitude would go unrecognized for 37 years. But I said, you know what? If this turns out to be true, this could be this will probably be the biggest story of my career. And so I and you know like I like I tell people, I don't report rumors, but I do but I do check them. And uh, it turned out to be true. And I wrote, a, I wrote an article in the Elwood City Ledger that ran on April 7th, 2007, and it received a first place Keystone Award from the Pennsylvania Newspaper Association the following year. And from that point on, I felt compelled to write the book. I, 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 get, I get asked all the time, what, what's your next book? And I said, well, I'm not gonna write any more books unless I can quit my day job because it's too hard to work in the, it's too hard to work in the word mill for, for eight hours a day, then come home and write a book. Thank you very much. If I could please ask Colonel Crane to come on up. We have a very short presentation. And he's not just saying that because I am very short. <laughs> Before I thank Mr. Poole, uh, I've got another thanks and some more recognition to give. Uh, I know we've got some here. So could the Vietnam vets identify themselves today? Could you raise your Thanks to all of you. Um, as uh, I was listening tonight and I was looking at the walls, uh, you know, there's a book presentation that was here before uh, in 2008 about the same brigade, the 506th. Uh, and of course, the, the book Band of Brothers and the movies uh, made the second battalion of the 506th very famous. But the actions of the third of the 506th, uh, 20 years later, are 25 years later are no less remarkable. Um, that talks to the heritage, it talks really to the mission of this building and the folks that work here. It's the tradition and the heritage that we keep alive by telling the individual stories. So the stories of guys like Dick Winters and Buck Compton uh, are not to be eclipsed by those of Moore and Molino and De Brewer and Sabo and, uh, and Dial uh, from the third of the 506th. And it's that tradition and that heritage that carries forth to the 506th today because that same brigade has distinguished itself in the, in the current wars. It's a tradition that's passed on. And for the Vietnam veterans here, when I was a cadet and a junior lieutenant, all of the folks that trained me in small unit tactics, Sergeant Major Charlie Evans, Master Sergeant Trent Nella, were all Vietnam vets. Our battalion commanders, our first sergeants, were all Vietnam guys. You guys trained my generation, and my generation's the ones that's training the generation today. It's your tradition, it's your heritage, and that's what this tonight is all about, and that's what this place is all about. So thank you to the Vietnam vets, and to thank you to Mr. Poole for this remarkable story of this remarkable man. Uh, you know, just a, I know you see your book all the time, but hopefully you don't see it in a frame all, that all the time. So uh, this is just a small token of our esteem and our thanks. Thank you.